Well, hey, good morning, Tiffany Fellowship Church. How are y'all doing this morning? It's a great day to be in the house of the Lord. Uh, you may have noticed I am not Pastor Barry. Uh, my name is Pastor Patrick. If you're new here, I am the youth pastor here at Tiffany Fellowship Church. Uh, it is my great privilege and honor to be able to continue this series, Your Kingdom Come, this, uh, this Sunday morning. Pastor Barry is down uh, suffering for the Lord in Florida. Um, you know, that's just how it is. Sometimes the Lord, you know, the Lord gives and He takes away, and that's, He's, I'm going to leave it at that. Here we go. <laughs> All right, so just so you know, Pastor Barry will be concluding this, uh, this series next week, Your Kingdom Come. Uh, so be here next week. You don't want to miss that. I uh, believe God has been speaking to hearts throughout this entire series because what do we desire most in this world? Well, it should be that God's kingdom moves forward, surges forward, that we see the kingship of Jesus spread. That's what we want. So uh, we've been talking a lot about parables, right, and the kingdom of God lately. And why? Because if you're going to pray one of the most powerful and life-challenging prayers that you can, your kingdom come, your will be done, is uh, that's a pretty big deal. That's a pretty big ask. That's, that has a lot of implications for us individually and us as a church. And when I say church, I mean Big C Church, not just Tiffany Fellowship Church, but all Jesus followers. Now, Jesus taught his followers about the qualities of this kingdom that we're talking about, the nearness of it, the occupants that would dwell in his kingdom. And he taught them in parables according to the prophecy in Isaiah. And why did he do that? So that those uh, who had spiritual understanding would perceive the kingdom and move into it and so that its enemies would not see it coming. We've talked uh, about the sovereignty, about the justice and the generosity and goodness of God. How our idea of fairness maybe doesn't match up to kingdom principles. God can do what he pleases and we can know that it's out of his love and mercy that he does it. So we submit to God's authority. Our king has control over our lives and in every circumstance. That should be a comforting thought. But as Pastor Barry has kind of pointed out, we have maybe some authority issues built into us as human beings. When it comes to submitting to God's kingship, to his kingdom, sometimes there's authority issues that we run into. We want to have a say. As Americans, we chafe at the idea that we don't have a vote in the kingdom of God. That seems alien. It seems foreign to us. We get snippety and jealous sometimes when God's generosity isn't meeting our expectations. Or we compare it to how God has blessed somebody else. And today as we look at another parable that Jesus used to tell us about his kingdom, we need to re-surrender to his kingship. To be true citizens of the kingdom of God. Because this passage today gets distorted by the culture that you and I have grown up in. So it's very important that we look at the kingdom of God through God's own word from a biblical perspective and through that lens and filter. And if we don't get our hearts flipped right side up from where they are right now, we can hear this and interpret it all upside down. So stand with me today as we read this main text. Uh, We're going to be in Matthew chapter 25. Now just a disclaimer and a warning to you. Uh, This is a long section Uh, It is a very lengthy parable, so stick with me just for a moment. Uh, We're going to read this together. So Matthew 25, verse 14 through 30. This is out of the NIV. And it says this, Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To the one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five, and master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold, see I've gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came and he said, master, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who'd received one bag of gold came Master, he said, I, know, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid, and I went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, 
here's what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. For whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw the worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the word of God. Can you say amen? Amen. Father God, I ask you right now, Holy Spirit, to come. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear. God, illuminate your words to our hearts, Lord, that we would grow from it in not just knowledge of you, but Lord, in in, in knowledge of how you desire us to live. Fill us with your wisdom and your blessing today. In Jesus' name, amen. Please have a seat. If, uh, if you're new here, I'm sorry, I meant to say this before we read that long passage of Scripture. If you're new here, we stand for the reading of God's Word. The main text, not uh, every piece of Scripture, but the main text, because we hold God's Word as the highest standard of, uh, of faith and conduct. So we want to honor God's Word, that's why we stand, in case you didn't know. And those of you at home that were like standing and saying, well, I'm still standing, please have a seat. Here we go. Now in the following, uh, excuse me, in following with our outline for this series, we're going to spend some time in the context with this passage, because context is key. If we don't understand context of the Bible, we can misinterpret it, we can make it say whatever we want to, and believe it or not, there's a lot of people attending churches this morning whose pastors are making it say whatever they want it to say. Our intention here at Tiffany Fellowship Church is always to let God's word be God's word. It's not the opinion of man, it's God's rule. So, uh, We'll look at the meaning of this passage. And finally, how do we apply this? Uh, we're we're going to look at what attitudes and behaviors does God want to grow in each and every one of us through his word this morning. And everything we've looked at previously in this series has taken on a present tense. Okay, There are things that God is doing in his kingdom right at this moment. You can count on them happening right now. These are things that you can do at the moment as well. Uh, We talked about how the kingdom is defined, how it comes in power, how Jesus uses parables to both conceal and reveal the kingdom to its citizens or its enemies. We talked about qualifying characteristics, and all of these illustrate the coming and indeed the present movement of God's kingdom. And there are all ways that we can experience and be part of God's kingdom here and now. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about future tense of the kingdom of God. And Jesus had quite a bit to say about that. Here's the context. Matthew 25, to start with is about the kingdom of God at that time. Matthew 25 is part of the extended teaching about the kingdom of God given by Jesus regarding the end times, and he's making this sermon, this teaching from the Mount of Olives. If you're like, that sounds kind of familiar, that's because Pastor Barry taught on this. It's part of the Olivet Discourse. Is Jesus teaching about when he will return. So, as we look at this, there's a couple of things that we need to know. First of all is this is that Matthew 25 says a couple of different things uh, about, uh, excuse me, about what's coming in the kingdom. And we can see there's a couple of verses up here I want to show you real quick. Matthew 25, 1 says, "At at that time the kingdom of heaven, earlier in this chapter, at that time the kingdom of heaven will be like. So Jesus is making it clear to us we're still talking about the kingdom of God. Secondly, in Matthew 25, 14, where we started, it says, again, it, the kingdom, will be like. So this isn't Pastor Patrick just saying, oh, I'm going to take something from the Bible and I'm going to make it speak to the kingdom. This is Jesus saying, again, I'm talking about the kingdom. So, now this is important because of the subject of this passage and it gives us a little bit of a boot stomp moment. Pay attention. This concerns when there's going to be a reckoning. This concerns Christ coming back for us and what we're supposed to be doing in the kingdom until that time. Now, the second point in context is this, is Jesus teaches the key spiritual points here, again, in the form of a parable. Now, just for quick recap to help you digest this, uh, a parable is a story with easily recognizable details that teaches a spiritual truth. Jesus taught in parables. That scripture's up there. If you didn't, haven't been around for the entire series, Pastor Barry's covered this also, but I'm going to put it back up there in case you had any questions on it. Parables are both revealing and concealing. Again, God desires that his people understand what Jesus is speaking but also to conceal it from the enemies of the kingdom. And third, not everything in a parable has an analog, and we shouldn't over-focus on literal interpretation when it comes to parables. We should stick to the main point Jesus is trying to teach us. Now, this section of Scripture paints a picture of a future event for each of us that pray and wait for God's kingdom to come. 
And we're going to expand on this in just a second when we talk about the full meaning of what Jesus says. But here's an important piece of context we can't ignore. Our lives now have an impact on our future in the kingdom. Your now is going to determine your next. What you do and prepare for now, what you're using in your life right this minute, is going to have an impact on you eternally. So it is with salvation. When you come to know Jesus and accept his forgiveness for your sins, it affects your eternity. There are also things that when applied to your life right this moment will affect your eternity. There's a cause and effect in play that directly corresponds to both the present and the eternal. Now, that's just some context for you about Matthew 25. Let's move into the meaning. This is going to be the bulk of, uh, of our message this morning, and it's all about talents. It's all about bags of gold. You heard me say it in the NIV. We're going to look at the ESV, the English Standard Version, here in a minute, and I'll explain why that is. But I want to deviate a little bit from the outline that we've been sticking to. We've got context, meaning, and application. We're going to stay there, but I think we'll benefit from an expository approach verse by verse today. Because there's things that we need to digest here. There's things that Jesus is trying to tell us. And I actually prefer the ESV when it comes to looking at this particular passage because of its verbiage regarding the wealth of the man who distributes it to his servants. If you have an NIV Bible and you're following along with that this morning, that's fine. It's still going to mean the same thing. But where you read bags of gold, here we're going to see the word talents. To me, That speaks a little bit more to me. And again, we read it a few moments ago in that translation, but let's go ahead and switch gears here. Go back to this in the English Standard Version. This is verse 14. For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted them his property. To one he gave five talents, not bags of gold, talents. They're the same thing. A talent is a weight for a bag of gold or silver. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability, and then he went away. Now a couple of points to make here as we, we grow together using this scripture is that Jesus is talking about, first off, his departure. When we read the man who's entrusting his servants with his wealth, we can read into that, hey, this is Jesus that we're talking about. The man with the wealth that's handing it down, this is Jesus. The wealth, that's grace. God's giving us grace, he's giving us his spirit, the Holy Spirit, he's giving us talents and abilities to be able to do things with. Now Jesus is talking about his departure, and Jesus is the man going on the journey, he's going away for a time, and his servants, you and I, are entrusted his property. A talent was a unit or a measure of weight, and later it's adapted to be a measure of gold or silver. And again, I like the ESV because the word talent comes across as a resource that I can relate to. I've never had anyone come up and just give me a bag of gold and say, here you go. Um, But talent I can relate to, and the reason why is because each and every one of us has something that we feel talented about, right? Some of you are like, yeah, I can, I, you know, I can blow bubbles with my straw into a cup of milk, and that's my talent. Like, okay, that's weird, but all of us have something uniquely that we feel like we're talented at, that we're good at. And so talent, we're going to use that word interchangeably this morning. Bags of gold, treasure of heaven, grace, all these things we're going to relate to this word talent. Now, sure, God gives me financial resources I need, but also the non-tangible resources I need to make an impact in the world around me for the kingdom. So when we hear talents, I want you to not just think about material wealth, I also want you to think about non-tangible resources. Maybe you're good at painting. Maybe you have a lot of spare time. Maybe you have an overabundance of energy. I don't know anything about what that's like. Um, (laughs) You laugh. I've had like three cups of coffee this morning. Here we go. Um, So the talents that I have are the easiest things for me to use as tools for the kingdom. And that brings me to point one about the meaning of this. And I want to show you something real quick. Before we delve too far into that, I brought out this thing. And my wife asked me at the time, she's like, what in the world are you ever going to use that for? And I blindly said, sermon illustration. I had no clue what I was going to use it for. So now I'm going to use it just so I can justify it. Here we go. So we've got money. So again, I said not all talents are money. They're not all financial. Some of them are non-tangible things. They're the things you're good at, the gifts you have, the time and energy you have also. The first servant gets a lot. He's got five talents, right? So I'm going to set that right there. The next one, not as many, but two still good. And the last guy, you know, he's got one. He's got one talent. And I want you to keep that in mind. I'm going to leave these out here just as a visual to kind of help you realize a truth here. 
I'm going to put that right there, and I'm going to walk back here. I don't know why I'm telling you what you're, I'm going to do. You're going to see me do it anyway. Here we go. First point is this. As we look at these talents that were divvied up, I need you to understand that every talent belongs to God and should be used for his glory. Every talent. James puts it this way, James 1.17, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights. Everything about your ability and what you were given as gifts, talents, if you've got an able body, a strong body, if you've got a super great intellect, if you've got random things that you're good at or things that God has given you, it's because they came from God. You did not develop those things yourself. Those are gifts from God. And understanding that is paramount if we're going to know how we're supposed to take this parable and apply it to our lives. All of us have been entrusted with talents. I love how Charles Spurgeon put it. If you don't know who Charles Spurgeon is, theologian, preacher of preachers, here's what he has to say. And I apologize for the old English here. I'm going to do my best not to speak in an English accent, but here we go. Um, All that men have, they must trace to the great fountain, the giver of all good. Hast thou talents? They were given thee by the God of talents. Hast thou time? Hast thou wealth, influence, power? Hast thou powers of tongue? That means you're good at speaking. Hast thou powers of thought? Art thou poet, statesman, or philosopher? Now, those are terms we don't use very often, but I guarantee you there's poets, statesmen, and philosophers in here. It's kind of cool. Whatever be thy position and whatever be thy gifts, remember that they are not thine. And again, they're not yours. Like, there's some talents that you're like, oh, I'm super interested, I'm super proud of, that doesn't belong to you. I know it seems really far-fetched, but the things that you are absolutely good at, that you've been talented with, they came from somewhere, which means they belong to someone else. They're on loan to you. Whatever be thy position and whatever be thy gifts, remember that they are not thine, but they are lent thee from on high. No man hath anything of his own except his sins. That's perspective. Everything that we've been given, abilities, resources, intellect, whatever talent you can think of, none of it belongs to us. All of it has been lent to us and entrusted to us for purpose. And when you start to understand, oh, I'm good at this. Why am I good at this? I'm interested in this. Why am I interested? I'm super passionate about this. Why is that? It's because God gave that to you to be used for something. He expects it back, by the way. We're going to get to that in a moment. We talked a few weeks ago about the generosity and the justice of God. And notice that the servants were not entrusted the same amount of property, right? Here's our five-talent guy. Here's our two-talent guy. Here's our one-talent guy. They were given each a different weight and talents according to their ability, and that's us. If we look objectively at ourselves, which how many of you guys know looking objectively at yourself is super fun, because then you can't have any, like, I'm going to be a little rough with myself right now. Objectively, I need to work out just a little bit more. Like, objectively, I need to maybe not talk as much. Objectively, I need to be a better listener. There's things, when we look at ourselves objectively, they're not always fun, but they're always helpful. Not comparing jealously, but functionally. We must accept that we're gifted and able differently because according to the goodness and generosity from God. And if I'm honest, thank God. Thank God that we're all talented and gifted with abilities differently. I was not gifted a talent and a passion uh, for painting. I'm actually extremely horrible at it. And you're like, oh, don't beat yourself up, Pastor Patrick. Not everybody is an artist. That's not what I mean. What I mean is I couldn't paint a straight line on a wall if my life depended on it. Like, my wife and I, uh, over the course of our marriage and over the course of the the places that we live, uh, have discovered pretty... um, comprehensively, I'm not very good with this at all. It's, uh, it's pretty awful. But she is, and she enjoys it. My father-in-law painted for a number of years as an occupation, and so he's kind of handed down some skills and some tips and tricks, and she's gotten very, very good at it, and she actually enjoys it. I'll fill the paint tray up, and I'll hold the ladder. She's got five talents in painting. I've got one. Like, This is not what I'm good at. And that's not an excuse. I don't just whip that out every time we move into a new place and be like, well, I guess you're going to have to paint this one. That's not not what I mean. (laughs) 
Somebody is like, you, Pastor Patrick, you need help. And I'm like, yes, yes, I do. Um, but she was clearly given more than I was in that category. And that's a, good thing, that's a good thing for both of us. She's good at something and she enjoys it. I'm here to help her to excel at that thing. That's a good thing. It was great for our home. And all this wrapped up, the talents and resources that you're entrusted with belong to God for service in his kingdom. Now, we're talking about this parable. Remember the parable, parable, excuse me, we're looking at spiritual truths, not necessarily all the details have a corresponding meaning. That's going to be important for this part of the passage coming up. For example, when we look at the investment of the servants and their ROI, their return on investment, right? You see the three servants, they've each got different amount of talents, they each get basically the same back except for the, the, the servant with one talent. This is not necessarily a principle. Not everything in this parable has a direct correlation to something in your life right now. And I say that to to caution and to make sure that we're on the same page here, is that it's not a kingdom principle that whatever you invest with your money, you'll always double your return. So please don't hear that. There's an entire false doctrine about prosperity that preachers will tell you if you make an investment, you should expect more than what you invested in. And I know plenty of people that that are not doing super great monetarily because they followed that advice. That's not what Jesus is teaching us here. There's a detail that isn't meant to imply capital gain. So what are we going to do with what God's given us? The second part of the scripture shows us the actions of the servants with what they were given and what the outcomes and rewards were. Here's the second part, second point in the meaning. Faithfulness is the measure of your kingdom inheritance. That's important, and we're going to talk about that again in here in just a little bit, but some of us have the understanding that because we've accepted salvation through Jesus and forgiveness of our sins, that that automatically means that every bit of our inheritance is already ours. Scripture does not support that statement, and that's going to come as a shock to some people this morning. Yes, you get salvation through Jesus. Yes, your sins are forgiven. Yes, there is grace. However, Faithfulness out of grace is the measure of your inheritance. Matthew 25, 16 through 23 says this, He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he had the two talents made two talents more, but he who had received the, the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Stop in here for a second. There's clearly two servants who operated in accordance with their master's will. They took the talents, they went and they did the work. The last servant did not do that. And when we look at the text, notice that the master entrusts them with his, their, excuse me, with his property according to their ability. We don't actually see the master tell them to go and invest it or grow it, do we? It's implied. Why is it implied? How do they know this? Two of his servants knew to go out and make use of the talents. One of them didn't do that. Why is that? It's really easy. The first two servants understood the assignment because they had a correct understanding and relationship with their master. They understood his will because they spent time with him, serving him. They knew what he wanted because they knew him. The third servant, we have an illustration of somebody that maybe doesn't understand what they're supposed to do. They don't understand the command and they don't have the relationship to understand the will of the guy that gave them money. Faithfulness requires knowing your master. Some of you are like, I'm faithful. I show up to church. That's not all that God is asking us to do. Your measure of faithfulness will directly impact your inheritance in the kingdom of God. If your idea of faithfulness is I showed up, what is your inheritance in the kingdom going to look like? The third guy goes out and digs a hole and then goes back to doing whatever it was that he was doing. And let's see how that plays out. This is verse 19. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I've made five more. His master said to him, and we all hope to hear this one day, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with little I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also with the two came forward, saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I've made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. To the one with five talents, the one with the most resources given, 
that individual returns with something to show for what he had uh, with the time that he had. He went out and he invested it. He came back with more than he started. And all of it for his master. you got to imagine that felt pretty good to hear. Hey, even more so when his Lord tells him, well done, you see it in the master's response. He's happy with him. His master said to him, well done. You're a good servant. You're a faithful servant. You've been faithful with a little. I'm going to set you as in charge over a whole lot more. There's key words in here. You're a good and faithful servant because you've been faithful over the little bit that I gave you. Now you have to imagine that the master didn't have just like, what, five, two, and one? So eight talents. He didn't just have that. He gave them a little and said, here, I'm entrusting you with this. Be faithful with it. And my expectation is that it will grow so I can then entrust you with even more. The small amount of blessing you're experiencing here on earth will be multiplied into a greater blessing in the kingdom of God if you are faithful. The second servant got two talents. How did he fare? He lays down what he's given and the master's response Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I'll set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Identical response. Notice that. It's an identical response from the servant with five talents and the exact same response from the master to the servant with two talents. It's kind of curious, right? Because our culture would have you believe that the one who has more and made more would be greater. Pastor Barry talked about it this when he talked about James and John and their mom stepping in and be like, hey, you're going to put those guys on your right and left, right? Because they've got more ability. They've got more talent. They're loud. And they're big. Like, yeah, I get that. I can be loud and big too, so what? Here we go. Um, you would expect that this guy that had more and made more would be treated differently, better. His reward would be greater than the guy with two talents. But that's because we've been taught from infancy that more equals better. So what does that say then about what God values? If God didn't reward the guy with five talents with way more than the guy with two, then God clearly doesn't value the idea that more equals better. Faithfulness is the measure. God's more concerned with faithfulness in kingdom servants than he is with the talents. I'm not very good at anything. All I've got is just time on my hands. I've got one talent. Fantastic. If you use it faithfully, then the person with all the talents in the world and that he's using it faithful, guess what? Your reward for faithfulness is the same. It's relationship with God, it's entry into the kingdom, and it's blessing for all the rest of eternity. And that should give us hope today, especially if you feel like I'm the one person that only got one talent. If you feel like you were the one that was given, what you were given to work with is somehow less than what you think it should be, let me assure you this. God did not make a mistake when he gave you the abilities and the talents that he gave you. Just because you see it as less is not as good, that's not how God sees it. He didn't make a mistake in, you, in, in, in when you exist, and it's not coincidence that you're in the places that you're in, because God can do anything he wants with whatever he wants. Maybe the five-talent guy is giving his time and his energy and his talents to a large group of people, and that's why he needs five talents. He has no fear of speaking in front of people. He has no fear in organizing people. He's got great dance moves. Whatever. That's how you know I'm not speaking about myself, because I can't dance worth anything. Here we go. God places them there to take the kingdom to the hearts of those that are looking for it in that area. Even the one talent, excuse me, the two talent guy has less to work with, but that doesn't mean that he isn't given the exact same task. That five talent guy can reach this many people. The two talent guy, maybe not as many, but the faithfulness in that area is what's important. Because do you not think that God desires to reach those people in the sphere of the two-talent guy just as much as he cares about the people in the five-talent sphere? Like, I'm talking about spheres now, but let me explain it this way. Here's an illustration. And i got to be cautious with my time. I want to respect your time today. Here we go. Illustration. I'm from St. Louis. There's a place in St. Louis called City Museum. It's a facility. It was a manufacturing facility for a long time uh, that's now turned play place and sculpture park all in one. So if you ever get on your kids for climbing on stuff that they shouldn't, this is the place for them to go. Um, And the beauty and the allure of this place is that it's all about the spaces that they've created. 
There's tubes to crawl through, airplanes that are hanging off the side of the building that you're supposed to crawl through. If you're afraid of heights, this one's not for you. Um, And it's not, catch this, it's not accessible to all people. And some of you are like, that seems unfair. You've been trained to think that way. It's not accessible to all people, but that's because the people that created it did not intend for everyone to access every space. I cannot fit through the little concrete hole that my five-year-old can fit through. There's a space that was designed specifically for her to be able to use her ability to be able to get into and enjoy. Can she reach the hole that's six feet up and crawl into? Absolutely not. That one's for me. But it's that understanding that allows us to be effective in the kingdom of God, to be able to use what God's given us and understand that, listen, if you've been given a talent that applies to this specific area, then by golly, use it there. And don't expect it to work somewhere that it doesn't. And if you've got one talent, don't expect it to work in the five-talent space because there's probably a smaller sphere that you're supposed to be operating in that God needs you to go and take the kingdom there. The owners of the facility, City Museum, wanted all of it explored, all of it enjoyed, and for that facility's purpose to be brought into completeness. This is the purpose of all of us being talented and abled differently, is that God desires some of us to go into the large spaces that require more talents, and he requires some of us to go into the small places that require less, but it doesn't change the fact that faithfulness is the measure of the value. It's a kingdom mindset. The one-talent servant could fit in small spaces where the five-talent servant could not. That should energize us. God created you for specific purpose with specific talents to reach specific people. Final servant to cover still. How does the master respond to this excavation as investment strategy of the third servant? Verse 24. He also would receive one talent, came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid. That's a key word. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. Hear what, here, you have what is yours. But his master answered him. Different answer, by the way. The first two guys got an identical answer. This guy gets the special treatment. Here we go. You wicked and slothful servant. Oof. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have scattered no seed, huh? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own, at least with interest. Is God a hard man who reaps what he doesn't sow and gathers where he doesn't plant? No. This is the root of the third servant's issue, and if we're honest, this becomes the root of our issue as well. He doesn't know his master or understand what his master values. And so instead of doing something with the talent, he hides it where no one can benefit from him. And at least he can say, well, I didn't risk anything. And we're trained to think that way. He's part of his household and should be in the same mindset as the other two servants, but he isn't. He comes back with nothing more than what he was given in the first place, but somehow it's dirtier. This is the warning and the opportunity here. It's the only time the master responds differently among his servants, and it illustrates again that God is more concerned with faithfulness than he is with talent. If you're not faithful with the talents that God's given you, he's not going to be pleased. It doesn't matter how much talent he gave you, faithfulness is what he's looking for. The servant who just exists in the house is called wicked and slothful. Was he given a talent? Yes. Was he instructed to steward it? Yes. The master's view of the servant who was unwilling to take the talent and do something with it is called wicked, evil, enemy. In other words, unfaithful. Is the kingdom of God inherited by the unfaithful? No. God views those who are unwilling to deploy his gifts as unfaithful. Furthermore, the master points out that you really don't have an excuse for unfaithfulness with the abilities that you're gifted. Even if your relationship with God is that he is hard and he's not fair, there's at least the acknowledgement that your your talents are not your own, and the very least they should be invested somehow. Final point. The kingdom can be taken away. Verse 28, so take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents, for to everyone who has 
more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who is not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. By the way, gnashing of teeth, I always thought was like, oh, they'll be in pain. Yeah, but it's not the kind of pain that we think. It's anger and frustration. It's self-pity. I'm, I'm angry because I didn't, I didn't get it. It's regret. It's remorse. And it's opposition to God. It's frustration. Anyway, faithfulness. If it is by grace and through faith that we're saved, and some of you are like, you're talking an awful lot about works, Pastor Patrick. I know. Hang on. We'll get there. I'm going to roll through this real quick. If faithfulness, if it's by grace and through faith that we are saved, and God's word tells us that that's the truth, then faithfulness is a response to grace. If you have experienced grace, there should be faithfulness. Faithfulness and willingness to act are responses to the gift given to us through Jesus and in concert with the talents gifted to us. If faithfulness is what sees God's kingdom grow and infiltrate the dark spaces of this world, then what does it mean for us to sit on our hands and choose not to use the talents that we're given? We endorse the darkness. Jesus says the kingdom will be taken away from them. This means to see the kingdom of God grow in us and through us is always grace and faithfulness. It won't, if we won't partner with the Spirit of God to see it happen, then what part do we have in the kingdom? Pastor Barry spoke last week on the qualifying characteristics of those in the kingdom, and among them, childlike faith, repentance, second birth, and obedience. The servant has no faith other than his efforts. That'll amount to loss. He doesn't repent. Nothing in his attitude has changed towards his master. It's reflected in his lack of action. And certainly he misses the mark on obedience. How can you be in the kingdom but choose not to participate in it? The final verse shows the results. The reward for faithfulness in recognizing your talents come from God and using them for his kingdom in abundance, both in joy and in continued opportunity to show faithfulness. The consequence of a servant who denies their call to faithfulness within their gifting is removal. I'm going to say that again. The consequence of a servant who denies their call to faithfulness and their gifting is removal. And it's a choice we all have. The question being, what are you going to do with the grace you've been given? This is the application. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. So what do we do with the talents and the time given to us? Here's here's how you can make sure you have ownership in the kingdom of God. Here's how you can do it today to prepare for what's to come. Number one, identify the talents that you've been given. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 7 says, There's a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit, and there's varieties of service, but the same Lord, and there are varieties of activities, but it's the same God who empowers them all and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Now we're talking about spiritual gifts. Paul's talking about spiritual gifts, but it applies openly to your talents and your abilities and your resources, your time, your energy, your thoughts. There's varieties of things that God has planted in each and every one of us. I'm not good at painting. My wife is. My daughter can fit in a small place. I cannot. And for different phases and seasons of your life, there will be different things that you're good at and different things that you're talented in and different resources that God has given you. Some of you are like, I absolutely hate this job. I had a job like that. You know what that was? That was God saying, hey, this is the sphere you're in. Be faithful in it. Here's the gift that you need to do to, to, to use to be good there to take the kingdom there. You're uniquely gifted. You. You are uniquely gifted. Each and every one of you. Every kid in that kid's church is uniquely gifted. Every teenager that shows up on Wednesday nights is uniquely gifted. And believe it or not, even the people out there that don't know Jesus have already been given a measure of ability and talent. I'm fond of saying that you are who you are, when you are, and where you are for a purpose. That's not a catchy saying, it's scriptural. God gives us uniquely and it's all from the same God, generous and merciful. But we get confused because again, we get jealous and we reject. We get jealous. I'm gonna ask you to do this, is reject the notion that you need to compare your gifting to somebody else's. Who cares if you have five talents and, or you have two talents and somebody else has five? It doesn't matter in the end because what matters was your faithfulness with it. What are you going to gain 
by having more talents. If you have more, fantastic. That's what God intended so you could reach more people for the kingdom. In the end of the day, though, when you have your reckoning and you settle your account with Christ, at the end of the day, what he's going to measure is your faithfulness. Reject the notion that you need to be jealous of somebody else. Be transformed in that by the renewing of your mind. Your work in the kingdom is obedience to God's will and utilization of his gifts. If you want to see the kingdom move in your life, start with using what God gave you. Find a place and a time to use it. If you don't know what your talent is, you don't know what your talent is, do you have time? Do you have energy? If no, it's probably because you spent all your time and energy burying the gift instead of using it. Start with one of these things. The very least you can do is time or energy. It takes very little besides faith to serve. It takes nothing but excuses to sit and watch. And Jesus shows us what servants with excuses look like. Two, invest the talents in the kingdom. This is Romans 12. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. The beautiful thing about having talents and gifts is that they're from God, and of which he is the owner, is that we're given all the tools necessary to spiritually worship. If God, if you, if God's word is true this morning, and it is, and you're uniquely talented, and he's entrusted you with kingdom treasure here, then he's already given you everything that you need to worship him. Paul states to the Roman church, by God's mercy, goodness, and generosity, we're allowed and empowered, not just through these talents and giftings, but through the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to take these gifts and invest them into the kingdom where there's no risk of loss. And you heard me, if you've ever invested money in anything, there's no risk of loss in the kingdom of heaven for those that invest their talents and gifts there. Third and final, understand the risk. Wait a minute, you just said there was no risk. Oh, there's a risk. It's just not one of losing what you put in. In the kingdom of God, there's no risk to your soul for being faithful to God with your talents. There's every certainty of loss for lack of faithfulness. Hear that. You cannot lose if you invest your time, energy, and talents in the kingdom of God. You cannot win if you will not do anything with it. Some of you are thinking, that's, again, it seems like I have to work my way into heaven now. This all sounds very legalistic and very works. Salvation by grace, through faith in Christ alone, there's no other way. James explains us, to, though, what that faith should look like. This is James chapter 2, verse 14. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm and filled without giving them the things they need for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. If your faith in Christ is what saves you and you have not works, then what is that faith actually doing? James says nothing. You're talented for a purpose. Those kingdom gifts are gonna be settled accounts one day face to face with Christ. What did you do with them? The real risk is that your faith, if not accompanied by action, is dead. And for the believer that's moved by grace into investing their talent as worship and honoring God, your faith is active and saving. You can say you have faith, you can show up to church every Sunday, but if the talents you've been given are not mobilized into the service of the kingdom, then the kingdom is beyond your reach. That's hard truth. I didn't say it. Jesus did. I'm going to ask prayer partners to come up right now. If you need prayer this morning, we're going to close this, this, this service this morning. I, I thank you for the extra time. If you need prayer for something this morning, if you're like, yeah, you know, I feel convicted. I feel the Holy Spirit stirring in me that I, I have time, I have energy, I have things that I've not surrendered to God to be used because they're his anyway. I'm going to ask you to come and just pray. Repentance is an aspect of a qualifying characteristic to the kingdom. Repent for lost time. That third servant, I'm convinced. If he would have dug up the one talent and taken it before his master came back in, his master still would have said that was faithfulness. You took it out and you did something with it. It's not too late. One day it will be. But not today. Not right now. We should live in a healthy reverence and respect for God and his word. 
His kingdom will reign forever and nothing will stand against it. If we desire His will, if we can pray earnestly and powerfully, your kingdom come, then we have to know that our role is that of a servant. Our part is to be faithful what God has graciously given to us so that we have the privilege and honor to serve the king, to see his kingdom move forward. And at the end of a life of faithful stewardship and service, through motivation of grace and by faith in Christ alone, we will get to hear. It'll be our privilege when we have to settle accounts with Christ for our faithfulness with the things that he's entrusted us with. My prayer is this. I have every confidence in my soul. I get to hear from Jesus. Well done, good and faithful servant. Come into the joy of your master. If you'd stand and pray with me right now. Father God, I thank you right now for this church. Lord, I thank you that this is a church that loves your word, that loves you, Jesus, that desires your kingdom to surge forward in this city, in this state, in this country, in this world. God, I ask right now that you would bring to mind and bring to heart the talents that you've already entrusted us with. God, I pray that our eyes would be drawn to them. God, I pray right now that we would have an awareness of it, an eagerness of it, a conviction to use them, Lord. God, I pray right now that your kingdom does come. God, I pray that you use us, your servants, to make it happen. Holy Spirit, I ask you to empower and embolden every person here that knows your presence and your name. God, I ask right now that you would bless each and every individual, every family, every relative that's in this place and on our online campus. God, I pray right now that they would experience the presence in their, in their lives, God, that they would experience your favor and anointing in these things. God, take their talents. As they invest them, bless them, multiply them, see your kingdom grow. I thank you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. If you need prayer, come forward. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Bless 